Hi, I'm Ted Price from Insomniac Games. On today's episode of the Game Maker's Notebook, I chatted with Christian Link, creative director, and Alex Yi, creative designer at Riot Games. Both are executive producers on the animated series Arcane. Alex and Christian have done something very few people in the video game industry have done. They've created a wildly successful TV show based on one of the most popular video game IP in the world. Now, even if you don't play League, you've got to watch the show. It sets a new standard, not just for game-related content, but for animated shows in general. It is beautiful. Now, in our talk, Alex and Christian share the ups and downs of both the initial pitch process and the production of the show. They explain what they learned moving from games to linear media, and they offer fantastic advice for anyone who wants to take their game IP and build a new reality for it outside of games. And most importantly, they talked at length about how key it is to ensure that what one does is always in service to the fans. Please join us. This city was founded to be a bastion of enlightenment. We are the city of progress and our future is bright. We were once one tribe. Now, we are houses divided. As time passes, the top siders are leaving us further and further behind. There's never enough to go round. It can either break you or forge you into something greater. Hi. I need to speak with one of the inmates. Who are you? I have to try and find my sister. Powder? Hi? There are people down there, hell-bent on destroying us. The only way to defeat Topside is to stop at nothing. We should prepare our own countermeasures. Imagining yourself a hero. I'm afraid this will be a very short reunion. You talk too much. Here we go. You people down here are all the same. Bit of advice. Don't threaten the guy who pours the drinks. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Hello, good to be hey here, everybody. Right on. It is it is uh, really an honor to have you here because, as I mentioned a little bit before we got started, I'm a big fan of the, of Arcane, and I have been fascinated with what it takes to get from the games industry to beyond. And you all have done something that very, very few people have, have succeeded at. And I want to take a lot of time today to talk about the experience and maybe get some advice for anybody who's thinking about making that leap. But before we go there, I just want to ask, how did y'all get your start in, in the games industry? Oh boy. Um, I think uh, what was interesting for Alex and I, at least you know, at Riot Games, I think it was, uh, you know, our first job for both of us in the industry, right, Alex? Yeah. Um, yep. And so, you know, we both started in customer support. You know, we we found job openings for our games uh, on Craigslist um, that looked dubious at best, but turned out to be true somehow. Um, and you know, it was it was just a very small company with a passion for you know this this game that. Uh, came from a mod, and I think it was, you know, it, it was really just, there wasn't really a big promise of like, you're going to have these, you know, amazing opportunities of a big, you know, TV show, or whatever it is. You know, I think the expectation was we're going to have like 20,000 players um, in the game. And so, it you know, it was just kind of like the Cinderella story, I guess, in many ways. Technically, I started as a community intern, which means I had an even more dubious future than you when uh, <laughs> when I brought you in. 
<laughs> yes, Alex interviewed me uh, for the record and, and hired me. Did you technically? I guess so, yeah. I'll never admit it on tape. <laughs> it's great to know, though, because it explains a lot about how your sort of your journey together and, and how you both came to to head up the arcane effort. Uh, but I also think it's fantastic that y'all started in support roles, and it, it says a lot about Riot in that you were able to move beyond support into much bigger uh, and creative focus roles. Is that pretty typical at Riot if you're in support there? I think if you were if you were with the company that early, odds are, regardless of what your job title was, you were, um, I guess, working in multiple different areas. So pretty much as soon as I joined, um, I had already had a lot of conversations with uh, the creative director at the time, Sean Carnes, and and you know, like so, it felt to me like I would have the opportunity to do a little bit of work outside, I guess, the specific job title, and then you know, potential opportunities beyond there. I provided no such uh, clarity for Christian. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it was just the, you know, it's a startup. You constantly run into new challenges, right? Where everyone just goes, hey, we need someone to tackle this. And, you know, people raise their hands and go, I, I can try, you know? So I think a lot of the ventures that we both grew into ended up being some of these things, you know? It's just stuff, stuff that was born out of the passion of our players and and things that we also felt like we wanted to to see, um, you know, I don't know, exist and, and, and be able to experience them, you know, go deeper into the worlds and the characters of our game. Well, Christian, in, in Bridging the Rift, you know, I, I saw some light references to your time as a composer and sound engineer, I'm guessing. So in terms of wearing a lot of hats, it sounds like you just dove into other areas pretty readily. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, uh, like, you know, like, um, like I mentioned, there was it was always just there was always something that was broken or that wasn't working. Um, you know, I think it was a good learning experience for both of us to know what it's like when like the servers go down and you're like at the front line getting punched in the face by like thousands of people. It teaches you values, you know, of what our players care about really, really quick. Um, and so you take that with you, you know, and whenever there's a new thing to grow into, um, when Riot started to grow. That was a big question for both of us, you know, like what is, what is, what are we going to do next? What's the next thing we're going to focus on? And, you know, after we both had worked in all these different roles, you know, Alex kind of started focusing on, uh, the creative of the game itself, you know, the character creation, the, the kind of the character design, if you will, for the game. Um, and I started going into sound and music cause we really didn't have any employed folks, uh, in those disciplines. And, um, I just felt that like we can do more, you know, with, with our music and, um, right give me, you know, an opportunity to explore that, which is really great. Well, I, I, it's, I, I do want to press a little bit on that because just jumping into composing music isn't something that most people can do. Uh, are, do you have a background in music composition? Have you always been a musician? Yeah, I, I was a musician before, uh, when I, you know, before I moved to the U.S. I lived in Germany. I was a musician there and um, produced a bunch of artists, was an artist myself for a while, but that, that career kind of ran into a brick wall and so it was just this thing of the past you know I, I just wanted to work in video games i always loved video games but when that question kind of appeared you know like hey what's what's the next thing for you to do at riot there was i was working on like network uh network operations live service stuff at the time and but i i just felt like there was the, the biggest there was the biggest gap you know music and sound where i felt like i could actually kind of add something and so um yeah, it was it was really just an attempt, you know. Like we we didn't really know what that meant actually. Uh, at the time, we were introducing these login screens, these like start screens of characters that come out for the game, and you know this motion graphic designer called Anthony Possibon and I just both were in these roles of like we don't really know what we're gonna do now, but hey, like how about we try a thing here? You know, you can mo make these these motion graphics. I can make music that can introduce these characters. Let's let's give it a try. We don't know. And it just kind of exploded, you know, and so that just kind of started uh, a trend, if you will. That's fantastic. And I, Alex, you have a degree in writing, right? Yep. And, and, which is, again, that's a that's a pretty awesome thing to have coming into games. When you joined Riot, did you think that you were going to put that to use? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it was it was part of being hired to be a community intern, but I think it was really at the point in los angeles when i had given up on having a career in writing that i uh was like you know what 
time to branch out, look at other roles. Uh, and that's when I saw uh, a Craigslist ad for a video game company, which I was certain would not have any, uh, I guess, advanced positions for anyone who didn't know how to code. Um, this was a while ago. Um, but then, yeah, it's been it's been a, a strange irony that I, I backed into my, uh, I guess, my degree career by giving up on it. <laughs> I love it. I think for anybody who doesn't live in Los Angeles, maybe providing some context for how writing is one of those com- jobs you hear a lot about in LA is useful. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, for me, it was uh, once once I, I finished at school in Boston, Emerson, it was a film school. I pretty much everyone was coming out to Los Angeles because of the, uh, you know, the movie industry, TV industry. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people out here are really looking to find a way to, you know, get into that type of thing. And it's just such a common it's a common story, right? That someone is like either a writer on the side or wanted to be a writer. Um, and it was it was really difficult around the time that I, I made it uh, to LA. It was just before the 2008 recession. Um, mm. So it was not the optimal time to be coming over for um, unreliable work. And yeah, things were getting pretty difficult uh, right at that point. Um, it, it was like, I would actually say that 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 was probably one of the most difficult times uh, in my life, and and it, I sort of adopted this strategy at one point of just saying like, all right, I'm gonna broaden broaden my lens at what I'm looking at, and just say yes to a lot of things I wouldn't otherwise uh, consider, with Riot uh, being one of them. Of course, I didn't know it was Riot at the time, um, but uh, it, it it again, strangely, it was another uh, example in my life of where sort of giving up or giving in, um, but, but I don't know, following opportunities that, that lead a trail of promise, um, wound up, I guess, dramatically changing, uh, the course of events for me. Well, it sounds like that was sort of the path you all both took for arcane as well. I mean, uh, and again, I, I really enjoyed the bridging the rift documentary that you put out. Uh, and it's, it seemed that in the beginning, this was for both of you sort of a labor of love and something that you had just cooked up on your own as just an idea. Is that, is that the way it worked? You just over a beer or something said, Hey, let's do this. Yeah. I mean, I think there was all, why didn't we have you beer? know, it was that, <laughs> sorry. I said, why didn't we have beer? <laughs> yes. I mean, certainly there were easier routes to take, um, and, and more pleasant if you will. But, uh, I think it was at the time where, a whole generation of video game nerds was just like, man, why can't I watch movies and shows, you know, about these characters? Like, why, why doesn't this exist? And why are we struggling to make this kind of stuff? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I would say it was kind of a selfish goal, which is like, let's watch these things, you know, um, that we ourselves as audience members want. And so we really had no idea how to get there, but I think we had a very clear idea of what we were chasing. Because, um, again, it it was a very authentic, you know, feeling that we had ourselves. We were just in love with the game and these characters. Yeah, we'd we'd had we'd had a little like a couple different uh, attempts to find ways to have higher fidelity. I don't know our realizations of the narrative of the story, and it just seemed like we were really struggling at making headway. And you know, Christian just had a history at the company of finding ways to turn projects into a reality and also just dreaming really big um and i feel like <laughs> like that th- that was the start of having that conversation and and in my head it was it was it was almost just just talking about a wild dream and i think it was that same week when christian's like okay we're gonna do it and it's gonna be a full tv show and i was like okay, well, we, we could start smaller. And he's like, no, 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 nothing less than a TV show. I'm like, all right, I guess we have to learn how to make a TV show now. I think I think what really helped in the beginning is that I always involved rioters in ways that just, you know, seemed to be pretty random, to be honest. But like, I think it created excitement. You know, when we had these, like, I remember the first tracks that we made, the Diana song, I think, I think was the first one we had vocals. You know, I, I didn't have any budgets for this. So I just asked around in the company, like, hey, does anyone sing? You know, and so uh, this like amazing soprano voice that you hear on the Diana music track was a graphics designer that worked at Riot called 
Lisa Thorne, who just happened to have this, you know, classical training and, and, and just stumbled over her and, you know, and it was, it was just this amazing surprise. And, and then, you know, we had other tracks like Draven where I had like a whole room full of, you know, guys just like shout, uh, shout his name in a, in the most manly fashion possible. And so I think it created also a little bit of this feeling of like, whenever there was like, Hey, I've got an idea that people were actually really willing to participate because they were just fun experiences, I think, you know? Um, and so I think this was one of those where, um, I was able to find, you know, uh, someone in, in, in Alex that kind of had the same dream, you know, of, of this kind of story and this kind of project, we bring animation, which we had experience in and, and storytelling, you know, which we had ambitions in <laughs> together. And so, uh, yeah, it was, it was a fun time. And it's, it's great that you were involving other folks at Riot. I mean, right with Riot being such a large company, was there pretty widespread knowledge that you all were embarking on what was sounds like an experiment at first, or was this something that you just kind of kept quiet until you made a bigger presentation? I don't know. I mean, it wasn't like this big announcement. This was really, we started very small, you know, there are other explorations to the company over the years that said like, we're going to make a movie or a TV show. Mm -hmm. And you kind of start through that lens, you know, we were just kind of going, Hey, let's explore it. Let's spend a little bit of money on some art. And if that doesn't suck, Hey, you know, let's see if we can create like a 3d model based on that art. If that doesn't suck. Let's do a little animation test. So I think it was, it wasn't just developing a direction of a project. We also kind of had to develop the muscle and the ability to gauge what we were doing and to kind of also in the process, teach everybody else around us, like, Hey, how can you judge this? Because None of us have worked in this, you know? So if you work even up to, you know, the CEO and president, they were like, we don't necessarily, like, we, don't, we don't know how to look at this. So I think we also had to think about it that way. Like, hey, how can we present this to you? And how can we kind of take you on, you know, this ride with us in a fashion where it follows a more video game inspired, you know, format and, and really just approaching things so we can kind of, yeah, learn on the fly. So I think that was, a, that was an important thing we had to do. Yeah, I think it, it also, in retrospect, it seems like we uh, had a strong confidence we were going to successfully make a TV show maybe, but I wouldn't be able to pick the point where things flipped from us being like, I mean, let's just keep going until someone stops us to us believing that, uh, wow, that's a real show um, and it <laughs> people might like it. Uh, so, you know, I think in the early days, just so much of the work was really build, building up our own confidence and our own knowledge uh, to be able to actually yeah. execute on the plan. Yeah. Well, what is what it sounds like you, you all were doing was creating this vision on top of everything else that you were doing while working on League and working at Riot. How did y'all manage to do that? Because I, I asked this because I know that whenever whenever I talk to any developer about new IP processes, it's usually that's something that you're building on top of everything else you're already doing. And it can be difficult to achieve a balance. How did y'all manage to do that? Well, I think, I think it was a specific time for both Alex and I in our careers. You know, I had hired a bunch of composers who more or less replaced me in the daily composing mm. responsibilities and were simply just much better than I was. Um, so I just didn't really have that responsibility anymore. And the question really for me was what, well, you know, what is next? I think for Alex, you know, his, um, wife had just gotten this amazing job opportunity, uh, in a different state and he was, you know, gonna follow her and, 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 you know, potentially even leave the company. And I kind of reeled him back in, um, because I think it was just a project that we both were really passionate about. And so it, um, you know, it, I remember actually talking to our CEO back then, you know, <laughs> I was actually kind of upset. I was like, why is no one telling me what I was supposed to do next? You know? And he looked <laughs> at me and blinked and just went, Christian, I don't know if no one told you this yet, but at a certain level, you're the only one that can really figure that out. You know, uh, that's when you like, you hit that level, like you're, you're a leader now, you know, like, what do you think should be next? And I think that was a bit of a, whoa experience. Um, and I think, but I think it also really helped, you know, and really being, feeling empowered to say, okay, let, let us really explore what that, the best version of this could be, you know, I, be, you know being arcane. Well, I mean, speaking, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Alex. 
Oh, I, I mean, I, w I guess I was just going to add that there was there was a brief period in the beginning when we were, um, uh, I don't know, I guess, perf like working on Arcane almost sort of secretly uh, once a week, you know, in the midst of the other activities that we had. Um, and it was, you know, at that point, I think it was the broadest exploration for us. And it was kind of fun. It was like kind of a, a once a week meeting where we we gathered up a couple other people and brought them into uh, Christian's dark little sound room and we would just you know sort of talk about all the all the potential what ifs uh, of the story and it, it you know it i think i guess you could argue that the moment that we really committed uh hard to arcane was when both of us you know decided that we had to drop the other responsibilities in order to like give it the time and attention that it needed um mine came on a slightly different path than christian's because like he was saying, uh, there were, there were, I guess, other obligations out of state. But yeah, I remember. I also remember Christian um, having that moment where he's like, you know what? I think I have to let the music team go uh, in order to be able to focus on this. And then, and then sort of the the period of handoff. You you were asking about um, building an IP on top of an existing framework. Um, is like, can you refine that? I guess with respect to Arcane. Well, what I mean is building an IP while you are building a new IP and the idea for one while you're working on other things. I mean, that's um, most of us in the business, right? We're, uh, if we are in a, for releasing big, big games every few years, something always has to be in development to ensure that we can keep going as a company. And so it can often, I, my, at least in my experience, it also create, it, it can often create stressors for folks who have multiple responsibilities on different projects. I, you're responsible for coming up with this great new idea and proving it out and getting buy-in from the company. But at the same time, you've got other stuff that you're doing too. So it sounds like, I guess what I was trying to say was it sounds like y'all were balancing, spinning a lot of plates, but you managed to make it work. Yeah. In some ways, I think that that was the appeal of uh, working on Arcane to me. It, it, I, I think I remember specifically having a conversation with Christian where I was like, I'm, I'm just so curious what it would be like if I devoted all my attention to one thing um because we you know with riot like with the with the way we were releasing content at riot it was you know champions skins and uh, various other uh projects that would require uh like vo or creative input and you always had this feeling of just constant mood switching throughout the day you know um yeah and and every individual group that you would work with would have its own complete history so you'd sort of feel like you actually had I don't know, five different personalities and you're just sort of flopping between them depending on which project you're working on. Um, it it definitely changed, I think, my my day-to-day, -day, uh, like especially in terms of how much time, I guess I would get lost in thought uh, specifically on, on this project. And I, I, you know, when I think about it, when you frame it that way, I do think some of the best things that I uh, contributed to Arcane we're in those types of moments. I always, I always say that the like my my places of inspiration are in the car driving, in the shower, and then usually at night when I'm trying to fall asleep, and then I have to do the the dance of deciding whether I'm going to wake up and write something down uh, in my in my phone or something, or try to go to sleep. Which at the times I go to sleep uh, usually means that I will be not sleeping a lot. <laughs> That's, that's, that's really funny. You mentioned that I, I have the same problem and I, I tend to err on not writing it down. And then I wake up frustrated because I think I just left the best idea ever, uh, to my subconscious, which just, just destroyed it. So, uh, what do you recommend for, for dreamers to write it down immediately? Uh, I mean, I, I think recently I've been writing things down, but I, I feel like I've made the sacrifice that you're describing knowledgeably at times where I'm like, you know what, it's fine. I'll come up with more ideas later. This one, this one can just go to the wind. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. That's great. Well, I, I want to go back to something that Christian said. You, you meant you were talking about meeting with uh, Brandon and, and what and advice that he gave you. Uh, in your documentary, you shared the experience you both had when you went to Brandon and Mark multiple times and were told, nope, and, and how challenging that was. What kept you going after being told no? Um, I would say it always came back to 
but it needs to exist. You know, uh, it, I think, I mean, I think for us, it was very obvious next step. You know, you have this amazing animation in trailers and features, you know, that are usually for kids. Um, you have, uh, these, these great fantasy worlds and stories, you know, like, why wouldn't it be possible to bring these together? Um, and it really just felt like no one was able to really imagine it because it, yeah, it didn't really exist yet. Um, but I think, I think it just felt like it just made sense. You know, uh, I don't really know how else to say it. It just didn't really, it didn't, it never really, I think occurred to us to say like, oh yeah, maybe never mind. You know, it was just like, yeah, of course this needs to happen. I think with Fortiche too, like, I think, I think probably the relationship with Fortiche <clears throat> also helped. I don't know, bring that confidence because uh, like the, when you know them, right. And you understand just how much they're capable of it. Uh, I don't know. You, it, it, it definitely fills your sails and gives you, you know, gives you a sense that whatever it is that you come up with is going to look and feel amazing. Right. That's just work that they will always do. Um, and it took me some time, I guess, to to develop that understanding with Fortiche, but you know, it's very clear because Christian worked with them on the music videos that he he'd already you know sort of established this relationship with them. Um, I think also it's difficult, and it was difficult for me to to immediately find the tonal space, you know, for an animated project that that we would we would ultimately you know wind up in. Um, and that was something that was just, it was hard to resolve against your feelings of like what league should be, because mm -hmm. it doesn't, it certainly doesn't fit in a, in a kids animated slot. Um, and there just weren't, uh, at least, at least in terms of the stuff that we were initially talking about a lot of good examples that could nail exactly, I don't know, the, the, the space we were looking for in terms of the audience that, that Arcane was meant to, to appeal mm -hmm. to. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of stuff that was, we just didn't really fit in, you know, like people were really nervous about, hey, our ratings, you know, like our game game ratings and, and like entertainment ratings are very different. Um, they rate things very differently. So um, it, it hitting our game rating and making the thing that we thought our audience wants was simply not the same thing, you know? And so you kind of just had to dance around those things and try to somehow make them coexist, which frankly sucked, you know, like we had to pull some things, uh, pull some punches that we really didn't want to, but can, can it, you give it, some examples? Because I think that would be great just as an illustrative, uh, as an illustration of the, of the path you took. Yeah. Um, things like language from characters, you know, like they're, they're angry teenagers. They're going to use certain language in extreme emotional moments. Uh, violence not for the sake of violence but like when there need to be severe consequences you know to characters decisions like some of these things that anything i'm really just stuff that was in the service of the story you know um or like it's it just it it you know it's still arbitrary to a certain degree you know how these things are decided like how many words of whatever you get and that kind of stuff and so it it just felt like we had to dial back on some things that probably i mean realistically make no difference you know but but um still kind of exist these limitations and i think that was that was hard um because again i think we had a pretty clear idea of like what speaks to our audience um and you know a small other things too i mean um i remember talking to the folks also at netflix you know like when you do kind of your focus groups like we were just really this bizarre thing on the side you know where um Typically, these focus group results, you get a pretty accurate, you know, in terms of like what you can like then can expect from the real world reaction. And that we were just quite off, you know, like according to the focus group results, we should have gotten like an okay, pretty good response from our audience. Um, you know, focus group said the animation wasn't very impressive. Uh, it was kind of like, you know, all right animation, uh, seen it many times before. Um, blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, we're very confused by all the characters and storylines. And so when it went out, we really didn't hear any of that, you know? And so, and, and that's, that was, that was an odd one, I think for everyone, because that doesn't 
typically happen that way, you know, in such a drastic fashion. The delta was pretty significant. So, so you know, I don't really know yet what to make of that, to be honest. But we, there was just like this was constantly the experience for us, you know, because it was yeah, there was really very there was no reference points really. That particular subject is a pretty fascinating one because we do usability in games, but and and we're always sort of building the games in and and taking the usability into account. How do you do that with an animated series? I it's okay, Alex. very difficult. <laughs> yeah. We I mean I think I think th this specifically this question that you're talking about is the thing that plagued us for the first couple of years working on the project which was uh how do you how do you find any way to to learn to create and then to evaluate your success in creating a show that you can't find any good examples of, you know? Um, and uh, honestly, I think it really, really, you you have to have a strong gut, you know. You have to you have to trust yourself a lot. Um, I think one of the things that that always or that that served me uh, in particular in working on this show was that I just had a fairly long history of uh, creating creating artistic things, you know, that that we would show players and and being with them right as they would respond to it. So I I felt like I knew the audience, whether that's accurate or not. Um, but that that helped me. I, you know, just sort of like make make calls where I didn't really feel like there was a there was clear guidance, you know, on those subjects. Um, I would say though that you know that looking at things that way and sort of trusting our instincts is just something Christian and I felt good about doing. And and like when we went into conversations with each other, hitting a lot of these points where you know experts would tell us uh, or people with a lot of experience would tell us this is something that you can't do, or this is sort of outside of the bounds of, uh, of, of what people are conditioned to respond to. Um, yeah, we would just have a frank conversation that's just like, I mean, but do you think it's cool or not, right? Um, and, you know, we were also pretty, we, we were pretty critical of ourselves. And, you know, one of the strategies that we had early on for, uh, like I guess bolstering uh, our our motivation uh, in the face of such an experience was just saying like, hey, we 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 don't have to be the experts now, uh, but we we trust our ability to recognize our own mistakes and adapt quickly. Um, and that I think is something that came from being at Riot in the beginning and and being in a position where again you were forced to or not forced to, but you like oftentimes you were running to cover some responsibility that was had nothing to do again with the job description um so much of early riot was figure out how to solve these problems that other game companies haven't faced before because riot was also a company that sort of really challenged convention um and also that spirit i think kind of infused our philosophy i guess in trying to build the show yeah what i would add is i think hollywood still underestimates the interactive aspect of games you know like if if any of us here on the call you know if if, if we now set out to adapt a book you know we will all have the exact same source of information you know like we will all know exactly the same stuff doesn't matter if we read lord of the rings in the 40s 50s or or now right it's the same exact source and truth but with a game like ours and games in general, there, there's this whole thing to add on, which is the behavior and the the meta understanding of these characters and games, you know, that exists among the audience. We definitely felt like it was important to understand how our characters feel to our to our audience. You know, like as a Vi player, as an example, yeah, you do know that if there's a fight, you will go in first, you will die first. You know, like you're you're just kind of that's your, your role, you know, when you're, when you're jinx, you know, if, if someone gets close to you, you tend to be toast. If you can keep the distance, you know, um, get a Kaelin or two that you kind of get amped up and get faster, like all these things, you know, there were characters that we designed for the game. Alex can, you know, tell you much more about that. We're like, 
we designed them to be very different and they actually adapted and, and took on these different personalities among our audience that you would be simply wrong to pursue the original direction of a character because they they just change you know i mean the, there's a character like blitzcrank that we like wanted to be this like murderous golem machine you know his vo lines are like exterminate exterminate but because the voice and the like the waddle of the animation ended up looking so derpy people were like he's kind of cute you know like he's he's kind of a jolly little golem that doesn't that, that doesn't really understand what he says but so that, that was just not part of the design you know and so how do you you can't really like you need to be part of the audience you need to understand these things otherwise you're just going to make things that don't feel authentic that's excellent advice for anybody trying to make this jump uh and i i, I want to ask after the show had been out for a while did you see players explicitly recognizing the how you had transferred the personalities from gameplay to the show because I mean, those those Vi, the Vi and Jinx examples are great. Like in terms of taking gameplay and 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 showing that their proclivities in their dialogue and their actions in, in the show. Were people just highlighting that in the feedback they gave you? Yeah, I would say I would say. I mean, honestly, I'm still a little bit floored by the uh, amount of faith uh, that that people had in us, um, or amount of like I guess the the positive review that they've given us. Um, I, I think, I think the characters that you see in the game are like the most embellished version of themselves. Right. And so yeah. you, you have the sense of who these people are in their most extreme moments and in the most dire situations and of course in combat. Uh, and so really the work for us was, you know, honoring those highs, but then finding the lows, um, and, and that was especially challenging for some of the characters because those are the decisions that specifically feel like they are the inverse of what you know the character to do. So Jinx, in mm -hmm. particular, um, the her 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 mania, right? Her her wildness, you know, was so much the signature of her in the game, and you know, certainly something that you feel like is the aspect of Jinx that players uh, uh, appeal to, um, but finding that quiet human side right the thoughtful side the emotional side in in so many ways you're always asking yourself are players going to look at this and be like jinx wouldn't do that jinx would just say something wild and blow something up um but uh you know i i i think it it, it really isn't just sort of like playing with that balance and and finding a way to make it feel like the transitions between those two states are authentic and believable and that that there is that there is love in why you're doing it and how it blends the story um i don't know the but the yeah i mean most of the things that people call out are sort of specifically that right like that that they still feel like themselves but it feels like we added layers that support uh what they knew as opposed to introduced contradictions uh for the sake of variation it definitely comes through i mean they i'll say just frankly as a fan that's what hooked me were those human touches versus what what could have been a cardboard just sort of a simile of of a game character right where they're just go 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 all the time so that was that was really well done i didn't i didn't realize that that was that was sort of a big part of what y'all did but it, now that you're talking about it it makes total sense and it sounds like one of those challenges that people can easily overlook. Yeah, Christian always talks about like when we talk about some of the uh, the the stories that that were the harder moments of creating the show about casting Jinx, and that was probably one of the most difficult uh, decisions to make because you know again from the acting standpoint, it's you, you get a lot of good examples of people who fall on one or the other side of the spectrum, and it's very difficult to to jump between the two without, you know, I guess, feeling like you're playing two different characters. And I just remember the first audition that we had with Ella, which was the scene where she, um, well, spoilers, the 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 scene the scene where she, you know, first meets Vi again. Um, there that scene of course is is really a roller coaster and i mean just in one take uh she was already 
really, really tugging at your heartstrings in terms of just feeling, you know, that that her mind was so fragile and was trying so hard to to have what it wanted, you know, but battling itself uh, because because of, you know, this sort of past trauma. And yeah, I think that that will always stand out to me as one of the prime examples of us uh digging digging beneath the characters that we knew and 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 feeling the risk and the fear and then and then finding something that that just validated that that quest yeah i mean um i mean there there, you know some characters we really had to take some big risks you know excuse me um victor was a character where you had to kind of capture the essence of him by actually making him drastically different from the game, you know? And, like, these things are just scary, um, especially when it comes to the origin story, you know? Um, but to Alex's point, it's, uh, I think, respecting what's there, but also understanding that it's not, you know, it's not our job to make exactly what, people are asking for it's our job to kind of know better what they would like because that's that's why you know we're supposed to be professionals <laughs> you know otherwise any machine could just deduce these things and so yeah i mean it was it was scary um at these times and uh i mean there's so many of those moments you know like the the ella casting where the pearly gates suddenly open after what feels like an eternity of kill me now um you know so uh yeah it was a, it was a long project well, well, you talk about you know taking leaps of faith, and it seems to me one of the another big, po- very positive move Arcane made was being built around three incredible women, like Jinx, Vi, and Caitlin. At least for me, that's where I I tended to gravitate when I was looking forward to the next episode. I wanted to know more about them and that sort of that relationship between all three, um, and. I think having a successful transition from games to TV led by strong female characters is a really great thing for our industry and our culture. So was just long way of asking, was that always the plan or did that evolve along the way? I would say that the way we kind of chose the characters was very organic. We just thought they were cool. (laughs) Um, I do think that we always really cared about uh, having like making them, I think there's a difference between characters simply being cool versus saying they're cool. You know, I think there's a good amount of um, stuff these days where it's just it's just a bunch of poser shit, to be honest. Whereas like, if, if you make characters that just intrinsically are characters you look up to, you know, that, that, that are brave, that make the right decisions in the right moments, I think, I think we just really, I think we did care about that. I think there was also a lot of um, us in those stories. You know, we have a very, global team that you know people come from all different corners of the world um everyone kind of brings a little bit of their own questions about society and politics and morals into it and so um i would say it was it was very organic in that sense um but i think in the beginning of choosing the characters i think it was really just we just thought they were really really cool you know <laughs> that was that was a very simple approach i would say yeah it wasn't it wasn't as strategic i guess you know like we never really had that conversation in the beginning that was like let's go with female characters you know it pretty much early out of the gate you know christian was just saying you know what about vi and jinx um and you know looking at the entire cast of league which also includes many non-human characters uh it was just you know they they definitely had a style right and it was definitely something that meshed i think with uh for Tish and kind of their natural inclinations, right? Piltover and Zahn being, uh, I mean, it's no mistake that Piltover looks like Paris. And then uh, and then just having, you know, lots of, um, I guess, like fine uh, artisanry uh, and have and like a lot of motion, right? For the, for Piltover's kind of steampunk aesthetic. It all just felt like it would lend itself to, to animation. Um, and uh, like, I, I don't know, for me, th- what, like one of my favorite movies growing up was Aliens, and it always it just never 
it never seemed so hard <laughs> to to make a, a female character the main character. I think I was always surprised at uh, how that that just seemed like something that people were either reluctant to do or where um, where like I guess people would run into pitfalls uh, in in not doing it from a from a like a genuine or an authentic place. Um, I just always felt like it, it there there's really no reason uh <laughs> that you can't make stories with women as heroes um it just seems like there were so many instances of that to to look at um but yeah it wasn't that, that I, I don't know i think i think christian and i very much were trying to make a show that we would love as opposed to trying to make a show that would make any kind of a statement hmm that comes through and I, a lot of what I saw too was a lot of care and and love focused on the character arcs for each of the characters and just from a purely practical perspective how did you how did you do that how did you map out what seemed to be pretty complex character arcs that intersected and diverged for all of the so many characters in the show well, <laughs> um, I mean, there was having, a certain having amount. messy minds. <laughs> yes, yes. God. Um, I mean, th there was a there was a certain amount of just brute force trial and error, you know, that had to happen. I mean, we were always looking for like those, you know, the secret golden formula of how to build a season. Yeah, and, that's what I'm looking for. The answer, right there. Right, right. And then at some point, you just go, okay, it just doesn't exist, and everyone just goes, well, you just kind of just write. Um, so I think we just had to find our own process you know uh it, it was it was you know a lot of work to i think get to the point where we mapped a little bit of our own system you know how we separate i think character arcs from from plot and how we track that you know individually um i i think we always knew that we wanted an ensemble show you know like we wanted there to be all these different perspectives on these central questions around technology and around this kind of this conflict between these two twin societies and characters, um, science, you know, in, in the midst of it. And, um, so it, it, we let it kind of grow in the beginning and scope creep certainly was a thing, but I think that's what we just, we just wanted that, you know, like we wanted to be, we wanted the show to have an aggressive pace. We don't, you know, we all know, or every single show that we love, Definitely has those episodes where we all go, yep, yeah, that episode kind of was a bit of a, you know, uh, bit of a downer or, or just nothing happened or so. I think we just didn't want that. We were willingly going into this thing of like, hey, let's, yeah, let's have packed episodes and let's move things forward in the story every episode. Um, and then at some point, I think we just needed to become as structured as we can be, you know, like every episode at, at the end of the day, we just approached also with, you know, act structures and kind of also measuring, okay, like which, how many scenes can we have in there, you know, and how, how much can one character get? So, um, took a while, but, uh, I think separating, especially plot and character arcs to clarify, I guess, what we're really trying to do with the characters. I think that that was key. Yeah. To the point of the en ensemble show, it just felt like <laughs> it, it takes so much time to build a project like this you know we we wanted to have as many champions as possible right uh for for players to to get to see their favorite champion on screen um without feeling like we were uh sacrificing the the feasibility or the interpretability of the story um so we may have overshot uh and then and then sort of scaled back uh, as much as we could um but yeah i mean i, I don't I, th I would definitely say that one of the hardest things in my mind about building a show that vast in terms of characters is finding finding some way to play traffic cop uh, with all of their stories. Uh, I, I, rem I remember at one point I made like a, a subway map of characters <laughs> with these sort of crisscrossing lines of like, this is where all the characters uh, meet in these different scenes just to try and uh, create more clarity in my own head about it. But uh uh, I, I don't know that there was any uh, method of note taking or documenting that ever made it easier to think about. It always just feels like this, uh, you know, like that ball of wires behind the computer uh, <laughs> when you're looking yeah, at an episode I'm, the first time. I'm pretty sure we explored every format and way to write a Bible and season tracking document 
I would be surprised if we has we if we had less than twenty or thirty um, and, throughout and the development. Did we ever succeed? Is the question. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think we just went meh and rolled dice. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we we stalled on writing the documents until we'd finished the series. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I mean, I I think I would say that we really kind of started to understand the structure as we you know approached the end of season one and and um could really track i think also our individual characters you know where where they came from where they headed and so i think it was it was really good um especially seeing the response you know because you have so many theories up until that point will people grasp this will people you know notice this and that and um we you know we i think both alex and i like the kind of shows when things are arguable. I think the best thing that I think we could see is when you go to go on Reddit and people are like, Jace is the worst, you know, right next to someone going, you're wrong and here's why, you know, um, he did nothing wrong. And someone else is like, bullshit, you know. So I think I think that's kind of the point is that you, you throw these hardships at characters and everyone, you know, makes a different decision and, and everyone has their, their own reasons for what they're doing. Um, I think, I think we did want that, you know, that we have characters that feel real and it really feels like the characters are in charge of the story. I think this, you know, people so often these days talk about, oh, everything needs to be character driven, you know, stories need to be character driven. And yeah, they need to be character driven. But I feel like so often characters then are in stories where they really don't have any choices. It's like aliens are attacking earth. I don't know. Are you going to defend the earth from aliens or are you going to say no and walk away and let the earth you know and everyone die like obviously going to do that you know so it's i think there's many versions of these stories where it feels like it's really just about like okay how are they going to fight rather than like hey is this a character actually have decisions to make that fundamentally change the outcome of their story and the world around them and i, I do think that we as creatives definitely gravitate toward those stories and movies you know, when it really is like characters can choose either way and you really want to know what happens rather than just the obvious, here's a superhero who will do what any, you know, good hearted person would do. Um, I think, I think that's something that we definitely really, really cared about, you know, and, and, um, and put a lot of work into. I hope Alex agrees. It came through. <laughs> really did. I mean, I remember watching several of the episodes and not knowing which way the characters were going to turn. And, and that was, as, as a viewer, it was fantastic because yeah, to your point, it, it's, it's kind of boring watching shows where it's obvious that the character is going to choose the, the right path or the left path. So that, that came through for me, I'm sure for, for your millions of fans as well. Uh, but something you said earlier, Christian, just from a production perspective, piqued, piqued my interest and that's pacing. Yeah, I took for I take took for granted as a viewer that the pacing was consistently uh, what I wanted as a viewer. It definitely kept me engaged. And so I know in games, at least the games that we make, we tend to focus pretty heavily on metrics to ensure that players always have something to do, always have something interesting to see. What's your approach to pacing in a show? Do you take the same approach? Or do you, or as you said, do you roll the dice and just see what comes out? I would say we definitely measured, you know, we looked at episodes, you know, we, I think usually we knew we would have about 12 to 14 kind of story beats that would fit into the length of our episode, you know, plus minus a few, I would say, you know, it was always kind of a, a battle um, with the French people who would be crying when we come around with some episode that is way too long or way too complex which we did all the time. Um, but I, I think there definitely was, you know, we, we, we especially over time, got to grasp, like, okay, how many story beats can we have for episode? Um, how do we also make sure that we really figure out who the driving characters are? You know, I think something that we did kind of halfway through our season writing experience is that we started to hone in on, okay, who really, really, who really, really owns an episode? You know, and that, that, that character usually has a flashback in the beginning of the episode, you know? So you really have like one character I was really driving forward one episode at a time. Um, so I think that, I don't know, also something that 
I, don't, I can't remember how exactly we came up with that, but it, it definitely helped with structure and committing, you know, really saying, okay, this is going to be the episode of character X. Yeah, that was, that was from the, uh, the writer's room. Uh, I, I would love to say that we, uh, proactively mapped out our pacing. Uh, but it definitely also felt like some of it was a happy accident of writing scripts that were five pages too long and then having to go through the uh, absolutely brutal process in the editing room of shaving them down uh, <laughs> to to something that could hit our minute count um, and and just trying to keep as many as many of our darlings as we could. Uh, I, I was I was actually a little nervous in the beginning that it was just a little too much right to follow um and it's you know for me it's kind of a an interesting takeaway that you know it does feel like we have overall uh a a faster capability i guess to keep up with content and and potentially that it is in fact a boon to to just really really keep keep the the valve open i guess on on your plot and and sort of like the rate of beats that you're giving to people i've definitely had more and more the experience that christian is describing where i'm watching something and i'm like i understand where you're going i see i see what you're trying to lay out let's get to the next plot point uh and i you know i think i think it may just be our our shortening attention spans uh or if you want to look at it from the plus side our widening capability to uh to to intake information I, that's a well. I, that kind of leads me to a question about assumptions. And what assumptions did you have going into production that turned out to be completely wrong? That it would take two years to make the show. <laughs> 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 um, I mean, hmm. um, good question. I mean, I would say definitely complexity and. You know, it, it's a hard one to assess because in the beginning, we were very isolated from the rest of the company. It was really just this wild bet that no one ever was like, we don't know where this is going. This is going to actually become a thing. And once we started to get more integrated into the ecosystem of Fried, the kind of the parameters also started changing. We wanted to create a bigger experience, and that meant we also want to do more things, you know, in our in our, in our our story, in our season. Um, but yeah, I think complexity in terms of I mean, just scale, you know, I, I don't think we had any like ideas that it was going to be easy. I would say more so in, 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 in a sense that you just don't know what's coming around the corner, you know, the challenges and, uh, you built, you know, we weren't just building the story and, and, and arcane we were, for teachers also building their entire studio. Um, so completely new teams that have to build the rig that have to do the class simulation that do the hair simulations that do, you know, animation that do everything so guess what when we started actually producing the first episode it was the first time all these teams were working together some of them just didn't work out together you know that's that's it's just that's we're, we're, we're all we're humans you know like sometimes th things turn out to be harder because something isn't quite clicking or technicality or so i think what probably counts for both alex and i and i think also the directors at fortiche is that it, it isn't the vast experience that we had that made arcane work out, I think it was our ability to just learn really fast, you know, like make a mistake once, learn from it really fast and, and, you know, don't do it again. Um, I think that was the most important thing. It's just kind of also knowing, yeah, we're going to eat, eat shit at some stuff, you know? Yeah. I don't know if this is like exactly, uh, hitting that question dead center, but, uh, I, I think I think this is something that I I may have I like I may have intellectually understood uh, before I went into Arcane, but something that became uh, like an emotional realization over the course of it, and it's something that you know I hold very dear today, which is just that you know you just spend so much time when you're working on something like this asking yourself if you're good enough, if the if the art that you're putting in uh, is like like meets a bar right or or can be seen as successful by fans uh what what gives me so much more confidence and is is a lot more of the way that i look at it now is just keeping this eye on on where you're heading right like uh 
it's, you know, to me, the amount of growth that all of us had between the first episode and the last episode of the first season, it's like, it's it, I, like I, the, when I first saw the pilot, I thought it was amazing, you know, artistically. And now when I look at it, I'm like, I see all the things that they weren't doing then that they are doing uh, now and are doing at the end of the season. And so, so when you sort of reframe that perspective, I guess, to Christian's point of like learning, learning from your mistakes, uh, you, I, I mean, you, you just feel so much more empowered to, to take risks and, and make mistakes. Um, but also to, to, to not necessarily feel like the, you're going up against the best that you've ever seen, right? Uh, m more that you are just forever climbing, uh, in the aspiration of reaching that, um, and I guess like uh, maybe the other thing is that I I did not think that the league audience would get a, let us get away with as much as they did. Um, I, I have the feeling that uh, you know when when you're when you're building the story or you're building the world, there's there's so many minute details that if they feel like they are in any way uh, off of I guess your own understanding, right, of the 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 truth of the game or the spirit of the game uh that you, those are things that people are going to um really hold you accountable for but you know it, it just seems to me so so evident you know with arcane that if you if you can show if you can show people how much you care about something that you're making for them and the thing that you're making at, is at least close enough you know to that thing that they love then <laughs> they will be willing to uh I don't know. Let let their imaginations wander. Have a, a greater suspension of disbelief than than you might you might expect going in. Uh, it certainly wasn't the case uh, occasionally when we would put out champions that would feel disingenuous to the game. Um, then then I feel like you would hear loud and clear from players that uh, that <laughs> that that the ways in which it doesn't belong in their world uh, would be articulated. That's a really polite statement. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, that's, <laughs> it sounds like, yeah, the viewers seem to be, I think, are you saying that the viewers were much more uh, accommodating and accepting of liberties, creative liberties that you took with the characters in the environment or, or setting? But, yeah. Yep. I wish I said it that way. That was a great way of phrasing it. <laughs> <laughs> I had the benefit of living, so first, but okay. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I have a sort of a related sort of very production related question, just because I'm fascinated about how you do what you do. Uh, as do, do you write all of the episodes before you go into production or were you writing episodes as other episodes were in production and dealing with feedback from those earlier episodes at the same time? Well, if you do your job well, you get the scripts done first. Um, and then there's us. Um, I mean, I think this, you know, that's always the, 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 the goal, right? Um, we definitely, you know, we're working on the episodes, you know, like first ones are coming out of animatics and we're still, you know, or, you know, done animation. We're still writing the last ones. I think what was also unusual is the setup that we had, you know, we, the relationship that we have with Fortiche is not the typical kind of, okay, we're just on the sharing side and then there's like directors and there's very split responsibilities. You know, we're very involved in the whole thing. And so, you know, that definitely, I think we didn't really have the ability to just focus on, okay, let's just get the scripts done while there's really nothing else going on. You know, it was, there was just a big production happening at the same time um, because we're so close, you know? And so um, the benefit is, you have a really this big team of people that really trust each other that can benefit from each other's strengths, you know. But but at the cost of also saying you well you you don't really have a hundred percent, you know, focus time just for one thing ever. So you just mm. you know it's kind of a balancing act. Yeah, and conversely, you know, Fortiche is, you know, they they are definitely involved with us in the in the story itself. So you know there there are times where. Uh, new ideas will come to the table and that'll that'll necessitate i guess taking taking a look back at the script also and this is something that's given me a, a strong appreciation for the difficulty of tv versus uh like something like a feature um 
y- y- there is a next season, right? The if you if you intend for for the show to keep rolling, um, your every every single discipline in the chain is essentially always they always have something to be working on, uh, and so so yeah, with Arcane, you you definitely are uh, doing your best to spin as many plates as you can, um, uh, and it. It definitely, like I would say, I would say it, it's a it, it's a difficult uh, road to walk. Um, also, switching periodically between episodes that are in very different places, if there are things that that require you to go back into the script, um, based on discoveries at different points in the pipeline. Well. Like you know, we we like to say in games that there's no standard production process across the industry, right? You look at every development studio and everybody does things completely differently. At least that's been my impression. Uh, and it sounds like with Fortiche, you all forged your own approach. Would you say that in the TV series industry, there is an approach or is it st- are most production companies still trying to figure out the best process? Um, I, I think it is pretty individual to, you know, how you just craft the story. I mean, I think there's also, so there's, the stories are so different, you know, like you, you, I feel like we all sign up for different things based on kind of who makes the thing, right? If I watch John Wick, I just kind of want him to see, be a badass, you know, I don't go too deeply. I'm like, well, what is the essential question here and the philosophical angle? I'm like, doesn't matter what kind of gun is he is he shooting um you know i think i think you kind of also need to understand a little bit like what what is the quality of the story you're crafting where does it come from you know um so i think it's it's a it's a very personal thing very individual thing and i think you know in games i think it's the same thing for for the ceos and producers of the world you're really more investing in people than in projects right because at the end of the day they're made by people. So, mm-hmm. you know, whenever I would, I kind of made it also my own uh, question to ask people really in, in these big studios. And I, I always try to ask them like, how, how do you fix a story when things are broken? And how do you, you know, uh, craft the season successfully? You know, I'm talking to people who worked on some of the most you know, successful TV shows uh, of the last few years. And, and the answer tends to be the same. Like you just, it comes down to that central person, right. Or to the central people that you need to trust and invest in. Um, because, uh, what's the, the famous Neil Gaiman statement that we, I think we also very much believed in during the, the making of Arcane is that if someone tells you that something isn't working for them in this, in their story and in, in your story, um, they're almost always right. When they want to tell you how to fix it, they're almost always wrong. I think that's very true, you know, and I think that's also what we kind of had to stay true to, you know, it's like when there's, when there's issues, we need to find our answer to the problem, but we need to stay in the driver's seat because otherwise the whole thing just kind of falls apart, you know? Yeah, Arcane, Arcane definitely presented some unique challenges in terms of, I guess, uh, using, using pre-established processes for making TV shows. Like we... We sort of converged, I guess, three different formats, right? Like we, we wanted to make an animated TV show. We wanted to make something that was feature quality, and we wanted the, uh, I guess the the sort of narrative style of, of a lot of, or at least at least reaching to live action. Um, and all of those have totally, well, not totally different processes, but they do have different processes. Um, the the pipeline for a feature or the amount of time you know that 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 you can take to create it is quite a bit longer and and the you know the difference between between that and tv is you're theoretically <clears throat> continuously making content uh, there isn't there isn't like a an end line and that's also one where um i think you would more typically have a complete script for the complete feature and that's when you start moving to the next phase of the pipeline um really even finding a way to try to have high quality animation in in a 
like like such a large amount right in a in a in a producible short window of time was a big part of of some of the early struggle of figuring out how to build this team and then and then i guess resolving assumptions about the the way you can iterate on story uh or or solve story uh between an animated TV show because of that pipeline versus a live TV show was another point where we had to, you know, we had to do like find some of our own answers um, because like, you know, it's different things are more expensive in each of these different, um, each, each of these different categories. So I, I guess I can also give you some examples um, in uh, like one, one of the decisions that we made early on was, uh, you know, we love Pixar animation, um, and we worked with uh, Ash Brandon, who came from Pixar, and he, he talked to us about how, you know, Pixar tended to iterate on story in the animatic, um, which would require uh, a lot of work on the storyboarding side, which j j just made that an enormous, um, enormous bottleneck in the process. Um, and especially because the, the storyboarders have have such a like they're 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 very rare uh, i guess the storyboarders that we have you know they they have to be able to to uh have a good eye for you know the 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 camera the 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 composition um already you know taking into account like a lot of the acting and the blocking um so in order to alleviate that we really moved a lot of our process into iterating in, in script um and then iterating script you know really uh that is something that is done more in TV, uh, but TV has a a different way of looking at what is difficult to accomplish in story because of the fact that you know, like, uh, as long as you can set something in a location and sort of you know fill it with characters, that's sort of I guess the cheap side of uh, of of doing things uh, from the the TV standpoint. So I don't know. It was like, so we, we brought people in from every industry and a lot of the work in the beginning was sort of like resolving uh, the different philosophies together and then finding finding something that would work for Fortiche. Also just the nature of our relationship with Fortiche, you know, them not really not being a vendor, but being a partner in crafting the story and us being, you know, halfway across the world. Uh, all of these things added, added layers of complexity, especially over COVID. Uh, it's a great description. I, sorry, one really geeky comment that I've just been dying to ask you. Did did you all use mocap at all or was that all hand animated? Or did Fortiche use it? So I could give you the answer to this or I could say that tomorrow you will find out. Uh, we released <laughs> the next episode of the BTS. Um, but uh, I mean, no, we, we didn't use any mocap. Um, uh, crazy. It's uh, yeah. I mean, it, crazy in a good way. Team, I, I just I'm so impressed by that. But sorry, I cut you no, off. No, no. I mean, our animation, and, animation and, team is nuts. Um, and you know, you'll you'll actually get to see um this Thursday um in the next episode, kind of what how the magic happened the Fortiche. It's it's my favorite episode probably out of the whole season. Well, the whole the whole kind of BTS series. Um, and yeah, it was all key animated. They worked with a lot of references. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think just really had this ambition to explore drama, you know, and animation as far as, uh, we could. So yeah, really, really proud of the team. Yeah. They rocked it. And by the way, it's also made me a fan of KDA, uh, thanks to, uh, Fortiche and you guys. So, uh, my, my daughters are very happy that I'm <laughs> going even deeper into K-pop these days. So, mm -hmm. Their, their videos and your videos were amazing for those as well. Yeah, those are really, really fun. And I mean, it, you know, give anything that requires like style to, to the French and they will probably knock it out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a, 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 just a couple more questions for y'all. Um, throughout our talk today and, and in the Bridging the Rift documentary, you've talked a lot about how the show is uh, important for the fans. And you both come from a, you know, uh, your beginnings were all about talking to fans, talking to players. What was most important for the fans? What did you glean prior to beginning the show? If you had to just boil it down to a couple things. Um, we had the theory 
and and uh, you know hopefully now a bit of the proof that we couldn't just do another kind of fight porn project where it's just about superheroes you know clubbing each other over the head it really needed to be human and really needed to have um these emotional qualities that you typically only find you know in live action stuff um and you know i think that was something that wasn't obvious because it also didn't really exist that much it you know it was something I, I don't know if our audience would have necessarily imagined that we would do this or that this could work. Um, but I, I would say that was definitely a big thing in the beginning that, you know, a state that we put in the ground, um, that we just really didn't want this to be just another, you know, superhero thing, if you will. Yeah. Um, and, and, but you know, we, we, we had the theory, but I think now we know that it was the right decision. Alex, if you want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was probably going to hit on exactly the same point. Um, I would say the the only other thing was to to trust the audience, right? Like, I think there are a lot of places where we took risks, uh, where the the risks involved saying, "I think they'll understand," or "I think they'll see what we're what we're going for here," or "I think they can handle this much," right? Um, in places where you know it really felt like we were we were going out on a limb uh, with those types of assumptions, um, it I think one of the most validating things for me is watching you know videos that are responses from fans in which it feels like uh, not only do they pick up on so many of these incredibly subtle subtextual things that you bury in the show, but they also find a lot of meaning in things that you may not have necessarily intentionally put in the show. Um, it just, you know, it, they're, they're constant reminders of, uh, uh, just what, what, what people are capable of, of discovering, especially if they love something and they really, they, they pay attention. Um, I mean, there are also, uh, little tiny Easter eggs. I feel like that were, were put in uh, like across the board by different people working on the project that are also for me, it's like in these videos with players show, they're like, look at this tiny, tiny thing that's written over here in the corner. And I'm like, Wait, I didn't know that was there. Uh, and then, and then you you think of the artist, and you're like, oh, I know what they're doing. You know, um, and it's always so rewarding. That's great. Uh, so, looking ahead, right? You've you've already announced the second season. You did that a while back, and and it's to me as a fan, it's super exciting that we're going to see it very soon. Uh, what do you? What would you like to see Arcane become? Hmm. Um... I mean, the the mission I think always was just to tell the story of our characters and take them further. You know, we always said in in season one, at least for the most part of the characters, we want to establish who they are, kind of get to the point where people feel like they they understand them and know why they are who they are. Also in the game, you know, in their core, um, not all of them, you know, but but most of them. Um, Season two definitely was always this thing that made us go, hey, let's take them further. Let's explore the corners of, you know, their psyche or their 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 characters or their identities that we just haven't seen yet. Let's really challenge them to break with their values and morals and, and go to places they've never, you know, been to. Um I'm I'm excited about what we're doing in that regard. Um, so you know, I guess I'm staying pretty uh, micro level here in my answer, but um, I I do think that that was really necessary to do that. You know, to really take the characters further. Um, on the macro level, I don't know. I I hope it just makes every league player proud and and every kind of you know fantasy anime animation nerd um, excited about our characters. I think if we do that, I think we're already winning yeah ta tagging on to that point it, you know the show has already become for me so many of the the things that i really hoped for going into it which is just for for it to be something that players would like um for for it to be a window into this world that i think so many people have poured a lot of passion into building 
Um, and and you know to to <laughs> to put put a weight on the other side of the video game curse, you know, just to make it so that uh, us gamers, you know, can see. Okay, there, there's just more likelihood that we can see more types of media featuring these worlds that we spend so much time in. Um, it was always the most crushing thing, I guess, when you're hoping and waiting for uh, like a show that comes out that features a game or a property that you, you're really in love with, and then it just feels like it misses the mark so hard. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward a lot to uh, all of these other uh, shows that are coming out right now um, in the hopes that they'll be able to make their case you know for why they deserve i don't know a little bit more uh trust or artistic freedom or something like that um in order and, and that that can work for fans who aren't necessarily uh people who specifically played the game that, that's great I, I have one last question i said i had a couple more but th this is my last one i promise and it's it may be a hard one it may be an easy one but it is more about giving advice to folks who are looking at y'all and uh, so impressed, like like me, with what you've been able to pull off. So, as somebody who's been able to achieve the improbable, which is to bring a beloved game into a different medium and set a new quality bar, what advice do you have for any game creator, any IP holder in games who wants to go beyond games with their creation? And it could be just one simple piece of advice or several. Um, I would say that. In the past, there has often been this attempt to shoehorn video games into Hollywood or into mainstream or into what, you know, the normal world consumes or really wants. I think we have, over the last few years, gotten to the point where video games really are part of mainstream, you know, where all the biggest musicians and sports stars, um, you know, big, sorry, I think I blipped out here for a second. Uh, the biggest musicians, the biggest sports stars, everybody really embraces video games now. Um, I think... It can really be our superpower, you know. You can see how Hollywood and everybody and and the big you know tech world they're like like they're looking they're peering through their windows right from the outside like what's going on in there like this is a huge industry uh, but we don't really get it you know and so I, I would say just really embrace that we're different you know I think we always try to do it with Arcane too we always try to just embrace that yeah we're we're just a different beast you know we're we're that's fine like in fact that's why we think this is cool. Um, so I would not just get too absorbed in the rule books, you know, of the established world and entertainment. I would just really try to think about like, what do you have to offer that's new to the world? And guess what? It's going to be harder. People will not be able to see it, but it's really the only way, you know, I mean, Arcane was a big uphill fight. Even when we had all the trust, uh, in the world, you know, within the company. Um, so, but I think that's just where you have these new moments, you know, that can happen when you, when you pursue these, these things that, that are new. Uh, I think, I think this may be advice that is only relevant if you are working on a fantasy or maybe sci-fi property or, or something, you know, that, that is based on a, game you know that that is played by a younger audience but through whatever means you can don't lose touch with that kid inside of you you know um that that kid never makes arguments based on business considerations you know in terms of making a show uh or making whatever it is that you're making uh and that kid is delighted by like a, a a magic or a wonder that when you when you put that into a good property everyone everyone resonates with you know like i think i think that's why we can all watch something like harry potter and just feel you know drawn to it even if that's not necessarily our thing um and you know like i it was always the feeling i think i had with a lot of the video game shows that didn't work that it just felt like uh the people who are making the show were reaching across some, you know, uh, impassable boundary to try and figure out who I was, you know. And so, I, I think, <laughs> I think you gotta, you gotta keep that part of you alive. Um, there, there have been so many times with Christian where we're having conversations that are uh, 
just so deep in the weeds of how you make something, you know, uh, that I am always impressed when he brings it back to just like a very simple statement of, I don't know, all this just seems dumb <laughs> or something like that in terms from the perspective of being a player and looking at what it is that we're doing. And, and when you reframe it that way, it's like, yeah, it really does, you know, and then it, and then it allows you to, to kind of change, I guess, your, your strategy and also just, you know, keep, stay focused on the thing that really matters, which is, are you creating the, the, the joy and in the experience that you want to bring for the people that you're, you're building it for? That is wonderful advice. Uh, thank you both so much for sharing, uh, not just your advice here, but in this whole talk you've, you've given, I know a lot of our listeners, a lot of great guidance for anybody who's interested in moving this direction and as fans, uh, you've given us a lot of great insight into how you made such a beautiful show. Uh, thank you for being on. Yeah, Thanks thank so you. much.